Uh, welcome back. I uh, hope everybody had a good lunch. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for putting together this, uh, this great meeting. And uh, you know, I know some of you, uh, but not all. So you know, it's really great that uh, the field uh, of uh, cold atoms and molecules now moving towards molecules, of course. And that means that we're going to have to break bonds and forming new ones. And so that's where chemistry comes in, right? So I'm going to tell you a little bit of story. My story is not as cold as you are, but I think it's still there are a lot of things to be learned uh, from these processes. Okay, so uh, so my title of my talk is going to be uh, exploring uh, chemical reactivity at low temperatures, and as you can see, the temperature is really not ultra cold. It's uh, you know, uh, but it's still interesting. Okay, so uh, essentially, at low temperatures, there's no way you can make things happen with a barrier. Okay, anything that has a barrier uh, is not going to react, and so you have to worry about barrierless reactions. Now, for barrierless reaction, of course, can only occur between uh, radical radicals and uh, molecular ions. And th these are the molecules that do not have any barriers. And so in these cases, and most likely, that people would actually tell you that the long range interaction is going to be most important that controls reactivity and everything else. And, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about our story, which is that the short range interactions can also be very important. Okay, and that has to do with dynamics, and so I will tell you why that is important and how it's actually affected reactivity and branching ratio and so on and so forth. And in particular, we're going to tell you three reactions. In the last one, I'll tell you a little bit about the branching ratio is dramatic. Okay, and so that has to do with these uh, short range interactions, not just the long range ones. So the three reactions I'm going to be talking about, one of them is actually the interstellar formation of water. Okay, which of course is important. The second one also has uh, involvement of water molecules. This is the beryllium ion uh, that actually, you know, uh, as some of you know, is very toxic. And it's the nice thing about doing theory is you don't have to worry about dumping your instrument after you're done, right? So, uh, and of course, uh, you can actually uh, replace some of the beryllium in the uh, cooling crystal by, by some other uh, the ions, in this case, uh, the carbon. And here's an isochemical reaction, astrochemical reaction that forms HOC and HCO. These are two different uh, cations, but they have the same mass charge ratio, so it's almost impossible to detect it directly. And so that's something that is of very uh, uh, keen interest in the astrochemistry, which is, I understand this is the building that we actually discuss those things, right? So here we go. First reaction, again, is an astrochemical reaction. And there are a lot of discussions about uh, water formation in interstellar uh, media, and this is one particular route that actually involves some of the iron molecules. And so essentially what you do is have the OH plus and have hydrogen, grab a hydrogen, you form another pro uh, 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 hydrogen atom, and you go through this process, eventually you end up with H3O plus, which in chemistry we call hydronium ion, of course, uh, and that is the uh, acid, right, in, in solution. But this is uh, uh, in the gas phase, and, and it combined with electron to form the water, okay. So this reaction has been, uh, you know, discussed in, in detail, uh, and because these things have been found recently with this, uh, um, you know, uh, satellite born uh, uh, telescopes, and so one of the most interesting thing I'm interested in is so so called the mode specificity. In other words, if I choose to excite different modes of this molecule, would actually that change, uh, would that change the reactivity? Okay, and it turns out. Uh, for iron molecule reaction, usually people think that it's not possible because it's chaotic. It's capture, okay? So whenever you get into the well, and that's how the reactivity is determined. But this case turns out it's, it's quite different, okay? And so there's a set of experiments that people can excite uh, to different vibrational mode of this cation uh, uh, by knocking out electron from water. And so you can see here, they can, you know, probe the rotational specificity. In other words, you can pump the different rotational state of the water cation and measure the reaction cross section. And it turns out there's a quite large uh, differences. And so the question is why? Okay. And from a chemistry point of view, as you can see here, this is a reaction does not have a barrier. So they just come in, the cation uh, hit the uh, H2, and essentially there's a well here, but there's a submerged uh, uh, barrier, but it's, you know, it's lower than asymptote. And so essentially people would say, well, this is going to be a capture and things should not actually uh, behave as it is. Okay? So the question is, how do we understand this? 
In order to understand this most specificity, you have to be able to actually come up with a full dimensional potential in your surface. And so this goes back to the von Oppenheimer idea that you separate the electronic motion from the nuclear motion. And so the way we do that is to we calculate at the initial uh, many, many points, and then we're trying to actually represent this thing uh, uh, in analytical form using a machine learning uh, technique and which, you know, basically neural network. And you can actually, interestingly, when we can actually do this thing with symmetry uh, uh, enforcement, so all the permutation symmetry of the hydrogen, there are many in this case, can be enforced. And such an idea is to, is to come up with symmetric, uh, symmetrized polynomials and that serve as the, uh, the, the import layer of the neural network, and you actually train this neural network with many, many points, and eventually get an analytical expression of the potential in your surface. All right, so we can actually show this thing uh, that is doable. We have about 80,000 points in various distances, and you can fit this thing with only about uh, uh, two mini EV of, uh, of fitting error. And the long range term, as I said, is very important. So we have to add in, uh, you know, use a switching function and so on and so forth. And so this is sort of the shape of the potential. You come in from here and you basically, as you can see, there's a little well here, as I talked about, right? And then eventually uh, escape from the exit channel, highly exothermic, okay? And so we can actually calculate this thing quantum mechanically. Uh, you can see here that these are quantum mechanical results, and you can see for different rotational state of the water cation, we do see a significant difference in terms of reactivity. So indeed, there is a most specificity in this reaction, which is counter the conventional wisdom for iron molecule reactions. And these are the experiment. Of course, these are not exactly the same. Uh, and we have a lot of approximations in there. Okay. So the question is, how do we understand this thing? Right? And so we started out by thinking about uh, in terms of very fast reaction process, we call it the Sutton vector projection model. So we assume that this collision is pretty fast. And so when these things come together, and there's no time for the mode of the energy to slush around inside the water cation molecule. And so by doing that, we can actually calculate the enhancement factor uh, by approximate method. Essentially, you take the vibrational uh, vector or translational vector or rotational vector for that matter and project it on the reaction coordinate, okay, at the transition state. If you can do that, and essentially you have the normal modes, which are vectors, and you can do a projection, and that's going to give you a number between 0 and 1. And the larger you go, the larger the enhancement is going to be because the coupling between the reaction coordinates is going to be able to facilitate the reactivity, right? And so this is actually uh, very useful for uh, the reactions that we just talked about. And probably some people have heard this plunge row and that is basically the, full, uh, the, the early reaction versus late reaction, uh, but we can actually do better. So here is a sort of illustration of what's going on. You have a reaction, and you have these transition states, which are, could be early barrier, late barrier, and so on and so forth. And in our case, these, of course, are submerged. These are bottlenecks, and these are not true transition states. But nonetheless, you can project these vectors, vibration versus translation, onto these uh, uh, transition, uh, the, 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 you know, the reaction coordinate, the transition state. Depends on whether it's late or early. You, you, you can have vibrational, rotational, vibrational, uh, uh, translational enhancement, and so on and so forth. And so I'm just going to show you uh, here is the, 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 the reaction uh, pass that we have for this reaction. Here is the reactant, and here is a little well before you hit this uh, bottleneck, okay? And this bottleneck allows you to have a, you know, so basically this thing is going to go up as a function of the total J, the rotational uh, quantum number, and then you can actually calculate at this point what's the reaction coordinate, and then you project out to various vibrational and rotational modes. You can see here that for this rotational mode, the projection is very small. Remember, this number is between 0 and 1. And but for the second rotational mode, this is the water rotational mode, and the projection is significant. So that is why, because the reaction coordinate requires this water to rotate a little bit. And if you add energy into the rotation of the water in the reactant channel, and then this will enhance reactivity. Okay, and so even when you have a barrierless reaction pass, a submerged bottleneck it can actually exert significant dynamic uh, influence on reaction dynamics, and that's what we uh, think is happening. And so, uh, well, uh, recently we have calculated uh, uh, that there's an experiment by this group at Göttingen. Uh, actually, it's not Göttingen. I think it's somewhere 
else in Germany. But they were able to trap this molecule, okay, and then, you know, leak hydrogen into it and try to see this reaction taking place and measure the rate and so on and so forth. Uh, and we can actually calculate that. This is a very quantum mechanical regime. So what we do is to use what we call the uh, uh, Poisson integral method called the uh, Ren Potter molecular dynamics, and that allows us to calculate the rate constant. All right? And so the details I'm not going to give here, but uh, essentially it can take care of tunneling as well as uh, the zero point energy. And so we can calculate that. And here's the agreement between the experimental data. This is uh, the dot is our RPMD results. And this is a low, very low temperature. At least from the chemical point of view, okay, somewhere about less than 100 is considered to be low, but you know, I, I know this crowd is, 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 is too hot, okay? So here, uh, another reaction, most of them are involved in hydrogen, uh, the water formation reaction in the interstellar cloud, and the reaction actually, we can actually produce these low temperature rates very well. Okay, so let me summarize here that despite the barrierless nature, these reactions can have most specificity, that's to indicate indicator that uh, the reaction is actually uh, uh, dynamically controlled, okay? And we can actually trace this most specificity into the, uh, the submerged barrier along the reaction path. And we'll show you this is not a unusual situation. Many of uh, these reactions have submerged, uh, submerged barriers, okay? And so we can explain that with SVP. And the last but not least, we can actually calculate the low rate, low temperature rate for these reactions, right? Now let's move to other systems. And another system, this is actually in collaboration with Eric Hudson and uh, Wes Campbell, and I believe that Wes was a graduate from Harvard, right? Uh, from John Doyle's group, I believe, right? Uh, anyway, and it's author suits. And so essentially what they were able to do is to uh, build a very low temperature, a cooling crystal of these ions. And then the leak hydrogen, you can see that these hydrogen, uh, the water molecule, actually they did hydrogen as well. The water molecule basically eat off all these uh, ions and uh, eventually you can see less and less and they can analyze the product, use mass spec, so they know the rate and so on and so forth. So here's an image of uh, what they've done. And the cooling was done by a pumping between uh, the ground and excited states. Okay, so that's, uh, that's their technique. And I, I, you know, this is advertisement for his, uh, his talk tomorrow, right, hopefully, uh, that, uh, you know, I have no idea what this things are, so <laughs> it's, it's really interesting to, to look from the two sides, the theory side, and with the build potentials, do the dynamics, whereas the external side, you know, you all the steels and uh, vacuums and so on and so forth, okay. Very well, okay, so what we do, okay, so they, they have done experiments, so we say, okay, we can actually do these reactions, and what we do is basically, we're gonna do the same trick as we did before. We have a short range potential and a long range potential, and for the long range potential, we have essentially charge dipole, charge quadrupole, charge induced dipole, and dipole quadrupole, and so on and so forth. And so these things are extremely important uh, to describe long range interactions. And for the short range, we just use the same trick I told you before, right? And just to show you how good these things are, these are the initial calculation all the way to about 20 angstroms. And of course, uh, you know, it's very long range for these iron molecule systems, but we can actually fit them very well, as you can see here, that this is our long range potential, here's the initial calculation, these are breaking down to different terms. All right, so here's the image of the reaction path. So essentially what you have to do here is the debridium plus coming in and form this complex which is quite low in energy, right? So this is, you know, definitely described by capture. But inside, as you can see, the hydrogen has to migrate from one end of the oxygen to the other, and so this reaction turns out has a little bit of barrier in there. Uh, and so that is the part that we talked about before. It's the same thing as, as you know, in the case of the water cation reaction. This is a submerged barrier, it's lower than that one. So overall, it's still an exothermic reaction, but you can see the structure in the strong interaction region. And you can see here as well, and so this is the, the, the way it comes in. It's almost, you know, it has no barrier, you know, capture, but there is a little bit of barrier before you come to this region, okay? And, and, and of course, eventually things break down, right? Break up. So, uh, so what we do here is to calculate this thing because this is, you know, a bit too heavy for us. And so we have done classical trajectory calculations at the experimental temperature, but we have to worry about what we call ZPE uh, corrections. The reason is that 
uh, in classical mechanics, there's no quantization of vibrational energy, and so you have to worry about you know things coming out of this uh, this well with energy below the zero point energy, and so you have to you have to somehow correct that. And so we have a way to do that at least empirically, right? So here's some results, and here's the experimental rate constant, right? And this unit. Okay, and so if you do QCT with capture, meaning that whenever you get into the well, you count, and that overestimate the experimental data. If you do complete, you know, weight in the product side, without the ZP correction, that's this number, and it's underestimate. But if I do this correction, and that's giving me a number that is correct. Uh, but notice something that this number is smaller than that number, meaning that all the capture do not come out in the product end. So why is that? Well, because I think there's a submerged barrier, so there's a form of bottleneck. And so essentially some of the trajectory were coming, got captured, and trying to overcome the barrier could not, okay? And eventually bounced back into the product side. And this, of course, happens in the relatively high temperature uh, in the standard of this rule, okay? And so, you know, if you have a really, really micro Kelvin temperature, the, the bouncing back is going to be very small. All right. Anyways, and so we can actually do things, uh, they can do things, uh, you know, HOD deuterium uh, substitution allows them to detect differential, uh, the, the difference between these two, and we can calculate them as well and seem to be uh, in agreement, and so that's good. All right, so, so let me summarize here, that despite the fact that there's a barrierless reaction, it's just like what we have done before, the capture model ever almost overestimate, and that is because of dynamics, uh, at least we believe. The branching ratio seems to be most statistical, and of course, uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on in the excited state. You have laser pumping to the excited state, with the excited state react as well, and, and it sure does. Okay, there's a lot of interesting things going on because the excited state is double P, so you have a spin orbit coupling. You can manipulate things, and so we don't know. I mean, you know, ho hopefully some some new work will come out of that. But for the time being, let me just uh, talk about uh, the how many times do. You, how many? Okay, so we'll go through it very, very quickly. So essentially, this carbon plus water is very interesting because it produces two species, right? And the two species have the same mass charge ratio, so it's very difficult to measure. And so the question is, what happened here? For those people who are, you know, uh, in, into the astral chemistry, they know this is actually a very important reaction. These two things are measured, but it's very difficult to actually measure its branching ratio. And so the question is, what is the, you know, the rule of these reactions? And Carbon plus water is one of those reactions. H3 plus plus CO is another one. Okay, and so we're going to try to do this thing. Right. So here we go. This is the potential energy surface for the uh, HOC plus HCO plus, and so you can see the energy is different, but there's a huge barrier. All right. And if you add something else, so that's not what we're talking about. You know, if other molecules such as nitrogen will come in and lower the barrier and so on and so forth, and that allows you to detect these things. But anyways, we can actually look at all these potential energy surfaces, which I have no time to talk about, but essentially you can actually calculate all these things. And you can see there's no barrier, but you can come in a very complicated situation here. This is the product side. The hydrogen uh, can approach the oxygen side, or from the hydrogen side, the potential energy surfaces you know, uh, involve many of them. So anyways, and so we can now calculate the entire potential energy surface for the system, carbon plus, coming with water, and you can see there's a little well here, and then you, you have a barrier uh, that leads to H, HCO, but there's another barrier from the same complex that goes to HOC, right, uh, plus, and you can see the barrier here, the height is about the same. So the question is, you know, if you do a poll, then you say, okay, the barrier is about the same, and they're probably going to have roughly the same branching ratio, right? And it turns out that's completely not true. It turns out uh, oh, we'll show you that. Uh, so we're going to do the same trick, and we're going to have potential energy surface calculated in the long-range and short-range terms. For the long-range term, we have the ion dipole, ion quadrupole, and ion induced dipole. We can go further, but short-range term, we have the CCSD uh, T, which is uh, the sort of gold standard in this uh, in this business. We have uh, fitted with the same method with a very small uh, uh, RMSE, and so here is the potential. You can see here that you're coming from uh, the entrance channel, here's the well we're talking about. There's a bottleneck that is right there, okay? And then you can actually go to the IM2. Then, of course, there's a series of wells and barriers and so on and so forth before you go out to HOC+. Plus. There's also uh, another way of plotting this thing. You have this, uh, uh, this is the intermediate, and then you have the barrier in there, TS6, and there's the TS1. You see the barrier is about the same. 
So the question is, which one will be predominant? Okay. So dynamics control of the branching ratio. Okay. So here it turns out is, is sort of basic ideas how to do this thing. The rate constant is calculated 10 to minus 9 uh, centimeter cube per second. This is very fast. And uh, it turns out you can see the HOC plus has a 98%. Okay. And the other one, which has lower energy, turns out is only about 2.4%. It's very strange if you think about it. So there's an experiment 300K a long time ago, and you can see this is about the you know, same kind of trend. Uh, the question is, what happened? Okay. What happened is that the HOC, despite its two things, are formed at the, roughly the same barrier height, and the HOC turns out is formed through a direct mechanism. So basically the carbon plus come in and hit the oxygen, and the hydrogen pops off. Okay, and that's a direct mechanism. That's why it has so many, you know, things, uh, so much higher pro 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 probability, where the other HCO is a complex forming. So basically dropping to it, wandering around for a long time before it comes out. Okay, and so, uh, so we'll see this, uh, these, this, this is a movie, um, of the, of the carbon plus coming in, and in a very short time, the hydrogen pops off. Okay, so it, it forms, and if you can look carefully, it's actually HOC plus. The H is on the O side, uh, yeah, okay. And this one is still wandering around, okay. And the carbon just hit it and hit it and keep hitting it. And uh, by five o'clock, this movie is going to end, okay. All right, okay. Well, it's faster. All right. So anyway, so let me summarize here that we have uh, ways to construct potential energy surfaces in, in multi dimensions, and these potential energy surfaces allows to study dynamics. All right. We do have short range and long range interactions, and the rate. Uh, it's very fast, and of course, uh, in this case, HOC plus uh, dominate the product, and so that's something that they have seen as well. Okay, and we can provide mechanistic insights as to what happened, right? And so that's actually important uh, for uh, if anybody wants to study chemistry. And so let me just uh, uh, summarize uh, what I've uh, told you today, and uh, we can actually now. Uh, this is actually a relatively recent event, and we can actually calculate chemically accurate potential energy surfaces, and that allows us to understand the detail of the chemical dynamics. Long range term, of course, is important, okay? And everybody knows that, but the features in the Australian interaction region in short range can also be very important, as I've demonstrated in, in some of the examples. And so, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the funding agencies, Air Force and the DOE. Computation is done mostly in the NERSC. And this is the person who uh, you know, did most of the work I talked about today. He's a professor now at, uh, in a Chinese university. And a bunch of other people that, uh, uh, that you may have known uh, from you know, you know, the work and so on. So thank you very much for your attention. Maybe I will ask one. Okay. Um, so you have this, uh, like, uh, for the first part, the uh, uh, dependence on the internal rotational state. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So you said the, the, the key was you have the secondary barrier. Right. Right? Secondary right. Barrier. So I w wonder, it's very important to know the secondary barrier. Is it in the long range region or the short range region? Oh, in the long range region, there's no barrier. Right. No, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a very so short range. What's so the location, sort of the radius of that uh, secondary barrier? Anstrom. So, Anstrom. yeah, it's a, it's a chemical, yeah. Okay, so, so it's very... It's a very, you know, it's very chemical. So it's all orbital, orbital overlapping, yeah, in these regions. Okay, right. so, so did you, in your calculation, did you, like, for example, try to uh, uh, change some short range interaction well, you, to see if... That, that's or, or just uh, uh, to see if you still get the same kind of uh, right. So we have mapped out the uh, you know six-dimensional potential mm -hmm. in short range, and so all orientations, as long as energetically uh, viable, will be included in our potential. Okay, so all the interactions are in there. So all the chemical interactions. So yeah. it's a, it's a six-dimensional hypersurface. Yeah, I, I know you uh, you also right. say everything, but I was thinking about. In principle, there could be another mechanism for this uh, rotational dependence. Okay. Uh, it's uh, you, you you know you, you have a rotating molecule, mm -hmm. and so you have degeneracy, and you have the degenerate interaction. That rotation molecule uh, in the interaction. So, so suppose that uh, your molecule has no internal structure really in the ground state, right? 
you go in and uh, with the probability relation the short region with the van der Waals probability. Yeah. But if this one you rotate it, then there's a possibility that you would instead of go inside, you would uh, go into a different state and replace it back that way. That way. So that's another mechanism that uh, the rotational dependence, I think, can in principle mm -hmm. come in even in a, in a non-range model. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, this is reaction, so you have to look at the product side. Uh, uh. Yeah. So it's not, you know, when you can come in and come out, but, you know, what's happened in the product side? You know, yeah, right, I right. think that for your, for your second part, right? uh -huh. I mean, those branching ratios, that's definitely a fair okay. range right, uh, right, right. Uh, effect. Okay. But for the first one, I think if you, like, separate uh, some calculation would be even more clearly demonstrate okay. whether it's a long-range or short-range effect. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other question? Okay, next, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so for your third reaction, right. ion in the water, I guess it was going back kind of fast. So, um, I guess to summarize a bit kind of what you did was you had to provide a very accurate uh, potential energy surface. Right. But what really depends depending on this, these branching ratios is the dynamic. That's right. And what sort of determines, like what's really the calculation that goes into So this is, this is the new, you solve the Newtonian equation. Uh, and, and and so so essentially, you you start sampling the rho vibrational state, and then with a with a certain temperature of the relative velocity, and allow them to collide, okay, and then then what happens is you wait in the product side and wait for these trajectories to come out in count. And so, what we discovered was that you know even these two channels. So I find that the higher energy ones are 97%. And so that is very surprising if you think in terms of energetics, right? This one is much more exothermic. And if you look at the barrier, it's about the same. Why should this be 90, you know, it's almost exclusively in that uh, higher energy state? And that is simply because that the carbon comes in, basically knock off the, the hydrogen very, very easily, as opposed to you have to wander for a long time and decay to this channel, right? So that's a very surprising result. Yeah. It cannot be explained by statistical model or thermodynamics. It's right? not ergodic. It's, it's not ergodic. It's not ergodic, yeah, right, right, exactly. But for this channel, it's almost ergodic, but that, for that one, it's very direct. But by just looking at these pictures, you wouldn't be able to tell without doing the dynamics. <coughs> No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's a very good question. So te technically, what we do is, first of all, we map out all these stationary points. And then we sort of establish the minimal energy path. And then we run trajectories. And then these trajectories pick up the points which are not in there. And then we add them and gradually sort of iterate the process. Right, right. Okay, this that's the speaker again.